So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jana Martin, Associate Director um, of Language Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm happy to welcome all of you to now the fifth session of our Spring 2022 series. The Language Collaboratory is a partnership for the advancement of intercollegiate dialogue on the teaching of languages and cultures. It's driven by language centers and institutes at the University of Iowa, the University of Michigan, the University of Minnesota, Michigan State University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our aim is to provide collaborative professional learning opportunities for educators of language, culture, and literature at the five institutions. Our series this semester continues our goal for this year, and that is furthering conversations on the topic of student engagement. We have addressed this issue from two perspectives, research and then pedagogical and practical. We aim to share insights and to encourage interinstitutional dialogue, bridging institutional distance and fostering a collaboration interchange of ideas. You are invited to contribute to what we hope will be a lively discussion. The sessions will be recorded and made available through each institution's website. We ask that you mute your mic at the outset, that you use the tools in Zoom to contribute questions and comments in the chat. During the open discussion period, please raise your hand virtually prior to activating your microphone. Closed captioning will be available through the live transcript button in the Zoom menu bar. Today, I am pleased to introduce Kate Bessani, who will present strategies for creating a classroom community of practice. A little bit about Kate. Kate Pesani is director of the Center for Advanced Research on Language Acquisition at the University of Minnesota. She's also affiliate faculty in French and provides research and curriculum consultation at the CLA Language Center. She regularly teaches the method seminar for new graduate students in French, German, and Spanish, as well as undergraduate courses in French linguistics and culture. She also conducts research on multiliteracy curriculum, multiliteracy curriculum and instruction, and teacher cognition and professional development. This collaboratory session will focus on engaging students through the creation of a classroom community of practice. Three strategies for building a COP or community of practice inspired by inclusive teaching practices will be shared and discussed. And we do welcome your participation. Before we begin, um, our discussion today, I would like to encourage everyone to attend our next session, which will be held on Monday, April 25th at the same time, so at 3.30 Central. On that date, we will hear from Carl Bluth from the University of Texas, Austin, about transforming second language identities, the affordances of multilingual life writing. And then after today's session, you will receive an email inviting you to provide feedback about this session. So please cons consider providing your input because we really appreciate your comments. And now with no further ado, let's begin. Anna, hi everybody. It's nice to see um, such robust attendance today at such a, a date precariously close to the end of the semester when everybody is so busy. So thank you for coming and it's nice to see so many familiar names in the list of participants. I just put in the chat um, a link to the handout for today and I'm gonna put it back in again for anybody who came in after I put it in the chat. So uh, like Anna said, I'm gonna be talking about some strategies for creating a classroom community of practice. Um, Clearly, this is connected to the idea of student engagement, which has been the theme throughout this semester. But I also think it's a way for engaging faculty, too, in the sense that um, when we connect with our students, I think we have a much more meaningful and robust experience teaching. Um, at least that's how I feel. It's one of the biggest rewards of teaching for me is being able to connect with my students. And I think it's a way to help support us as teachers when we're going through difficult times, just like our students are. This is. I don't, I don't think we talk enough about teachers at this point in history and how hard our jobs are. Um, and I think connecting with our students is a way to kind of make that job a little bit easier and more meaningful. So um, I wanna to begin today, before I start giving some examples of um, how I have created a classroom community of practice, I wanna begin by doing a Jamboard activity 
I'll put the separate link to the Jamboard in the chat, but it's also on the handout that I put in the chat. Um, so you should be able to open it right up. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see the Jamboard. Um, and we're gonna start with question one. So how do you define a classroom community of practice? Your answer can be a word, phrase, or sentence. And I, I should say that I have shamelessly stolen this format of the Jamboard from Yana, Adolfo, and Caitlin, who did this at a presentation a few weeks, months, I don't know how long ago it was, but I thought it was such a great format. So um, if, you, if there's an answer that somebody puts in here that you find really interesting or compelling, feel free to put a star next to it. Um, and we can maybe talk through some of the ones that have received the most stars. So I'm seeing a lot of common themes in here about shared goals um, and um, sort of relationships, togetherness. Um, I also really like the one, and I think a lot of people are putting stars next to this one, everybody feels ownership and contributes. I think that's a really important outcome of um, creating a classroom community of practice, that it's not just the teacher standing up in front of the room. Um, making all of the decisions, but that students also have some agency in what's happening in the classroom. Um, and then there's some really great adjectives here like respect, trust, belonging, and engagement. And I think all of those are also really important outcomes of creating a classroom community of practice. Um, so thank you all for um, these contributions. Um, I love that there are some affinities across the different responses and um, Many of these resonate with the way that I think about it as well. So what I'd like to do is talk about three examples of ways that I have fostered a classroom community of practice with my students. And the examples that I'm going to give are applicable to any course that you teach. So this is something that I strive to do no matter whether I'm teaching a methods course for graduate students, whether I'm teaching a linguistics course, a language course, whatever it is. I think these strategies can work um, with your students. And I should say that um, a couple of the activities I'm gonna share with you were inspired by a, um, make this a little bit bigger, inspired by a um, inclusive teaching course that I took here at the University of Minnesota. I credit the course here at the bottom of the handout, um, but it was led by Anita Gonzalez and Claire Forsty at the Center for Educational Innovation. If you're a, um, an employee of the University of Minnesota, I highly recommend this Foundations of Inclusive Teaching Program. I thought it was extremely valuable. Um, so anyway, I just want to give a shout out to Anita and Claire for, um, for their um, leadership in that particular program that I did. But the first example that I'm going to talk about was not developed as a result of the um, the Foundations of Inclusive Teaching um, course that I did. It's something that I've been doing for many years um, and it's what I like to call best class. And so I like students to think about the characteristics of the best class that they've ever taken. And then to think about how they can contribute to making the class they're taking with me make that top list, right? So I have them sort of think about, well, what are the top five classes you've ever had? What made them great? Um, and how can we sort of bring those ideas into what we're doing? So the way that I've done this most recently is um, through a syllabus quiz that students complete before the first day of the semester. And I ask a question that I usually have a statement about classroom climate on my, on my syllabus. And so I have students read it. And then I ask them in the syllabus quiz to provide an example of one thing that they can do to contribute to creating a positive classroom climate and ensure that the class makes their list of best classes. And then when we get together on the first day of class, I, I craft a whole activity 
around their answers to that question. So I have students work in groups of three to compare their answers, and they have to identify one or two actions or behaviors um, that they think are um, most important. I'm sorry, I've got a typo in here. Um, and then during the follow-up, I have them share those actions or behaviors and we construct a master list on the board. And then I take a photo of that and I post it in our Canvas course site. And I'll, re I'll refer back to that at various points in the semester. Sometimes if students are being reticent about participating in class, for instance, I'll go back to our, our agreement about how we're gonna make this class run and say, okay, everybody agreed. I'm gonna do my best to speak French all the time in small groups and during follow-up. So let me just remind you about that. And maybe let's talk about some strategies about how you might feel more comfortable achieving that part of our agreement. Um, so it's something that we refer back to at multiple points in the semester. Um, we're getting ready, for instance, in my class this semester to talk about some hot topics. We're gonna to be talking about anti-Asian racism in France related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I remind them of our agreement because one of the, um, the actions or behaviors that students identified was being respectful to everybody and their opinions and their backgrounds. And so I remind them of that as we enter into discussions of these difficult topics related to racism. So that's my first example. I'm just gonna check the chat because I see, um, Okay, it's just about the Jamboard. I just wanna make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Um, the second example is an idea that I did get from this inclusive teaching um, workshop that I participated in and it's check-ins. And a lot of you probably do like a midterm evaluation of your students just to kind of take the temperature of your, of your classroom to see how things are going. You might have made use of your teaching center on campus to have somebody come in and do that for you. Um, this is a more informal way of gathering feedback, and it's something that you can do at multiple points during the, the semester. And it's a way for you to get anonymous feedback from your students on the way that you're structuring class activities. Um, and so I did this for the first time this semester, and I found it extremely useful. Um, and I'm going to describe how I did it. So um, at the end of the second week of the semester, I did a, I selected questions from this critical incident questionnaire that I have linked on the handout. Um, and I, maybe I'll open that up so I can show you which of the questions that I asked. Um, so I asked, um, what did I ask? So I think I combined the first couple of questions and said, what activities um, or actions made you feel most engaged, have made you feel most engaged or have most contributed to your learning? Then I asked one that um, was about what was puzzling or confusing. And then the last question was, what new activities or actions could be incorporated into this class to better support your learning? So I, I just asked three questions. And I did it in old school paper format and had students do it at the end of class one day before they left. It was kind of their exit ticket. And then instead of just sort of internalizing the information for myself, what I did was I, um, I actually summarized the trends that I found in students' answers. And for the next day in class, I presented those on a slide. I said, here are sort of the general feedback that I got from you. And then I put it in a table in one column. And then the other column, I listed all of the ways that I was gonna respond to those comments to show them that this wasn't just an exercise in saying what they liked and didn't like, but it was also a call to action for myself so that I was actively responding to what students were getting out of the class and making adjustments in my pedagogy as a result of their feedback. So getting back to our Jamboard, you know, this idea of agency and that students are, are contributing to um, the way that different class periods are structured. Um, and so that has been extremely helpful for me. And I think it helped the students feel heard and seen in my class. And so I did that at the end of week two. And then I also did it again at the midterm just to check in to make sure everything was going OK. Um, I have not done a third check in. I think my students are so tapped out right now that there's really no point in gathering feedback. And we're so close to the end um, that and things seem to be going pretty well. But you could certainly do it more than twice during the semester if you found it useful. 
Um, I do want to mention too that this is a inclusive teaching strategy because it does give voice to students who might not feel empowered to critique what's happening in the class. And because I think the key thing here is that it's done anonymously so that all students feel like they can say what they want. And I think doing the follow-up part of it is really important so that students feel that their voice has been heard. Um, and so that's really what makes it an inclusive teaching strategy. The third example is um, a think pair share with note cards. And so this is another strategy that I learned from my inclusive teaching um, workshop that incorporates this idea of anonymity. Um, and so many of you may be familiar with the think pair share format of constructing activities, but I'll go ahead and um, explain what it is. So um, it's a way of scaffolding discussion of complex topics so that students first they, they receive some kind of a prompt, a question or a set of questions, and um, they have time on their own to think about it. Um, they might even take notes on a handout that you provide for them. Um, and so that's what I have under here. So think, present them with a list of questions and give them a few minutes to individually reflect. Then they pair up with a partner and they share their answers. I have found that it's the most successful way to structure the pair work is to have students share their answers and then hone in on one or two ideas that they want to share. So they're really focused during the, the pairing part. And then in the share part, instead of having students orally share their ideas, they anonymously write their ideas on note cards, one idea per note card. Um, and again, this is a way for all students to have a voice in the follow-up discussion. It helps with students who might not feel empowered to participate or who are nervous about participating in the target language. Um, they can write an idea down and they're having a voice in the follow-up conversation. And so what I do with these is that as the responses are coming in, I start organizing them thematically um, so that I, similar ideas are grouped together. And then I'll pull maybe one or two of the ideas from each thematic group and I'll read them aloud. And then I'll ask students to react or respond to the ideas that their, um, that their colleagues have, have shared with the class. And this has been, this is the first time I've done this this semester as well. And this has been extremely successful um, in getting students, all students to participate. Um, my students are very active participators during group work. And then some of them are very nervous about sharing out um, during whole class discussions. And this has been a really good way to get lots of different ideas from students. Um, so I, I highly recommend this one. Um, so there is a question. Oh, Yana, so is this in relation to um, the feedback that I got or for the think pair share? That was the second activity. Yeah, so one of the things that surprised me, I had done this elaborate activity on the whiteboard where they were working in groups and then they had to go to somebody else's area on the whiteboard and make feedback on that. And then they had to do mini presentations and they loved it. And it really surprised me because I thought they weren't gonna like the mini presentations that they had to do, but they all said that the way that it was done in stages, they really enjoyed. And so I've repeated that multiple times during the semester. The second time I did it, the activity was way too elaborate. So I had to kind of dial it back a little bit, but um, so yeah, so that was really surprising. Um, the other thing is that um, I have in the past used um, little colored pieces of paper to organize groups. So each piece of paper will have a color, a number, and a letter. And then during each class period, I'll mix up the groups so that students are always working with somebody different. Um, and they didn't like that at all. They found it was difficult to find their group members. And they also said that they sometimes, some students said they really liked working in the same groups all the time. Some groups said they didn't, they liked changing. And so I, um, I'll alternate one class period, they won't change groups, another class period, they'll change groups so that I'm, I'm meeting everybody's needs. Um, so that was really, really, I don't know if it was unexpected, but it was super useful feedback to help me rethink the way that I do group activities. Um, okay, so those are my three examples. Um, going back to the Jamboard, if I can see it here. I'm curious to know 
what kinds of activities you do to build a classroom community of practice. So go ahead and, and um, add anything that you do, because I'm always looking for new things to add to my repertoire, and I'm sure other people are too. And go ahead and add that to the Jamboard. And again, if you feel like starring ones that you really like, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, just add an idea. And I'll, while you guys are doing that, I see Dan has asked a question. Do I do the feedback activities in English? So Dan, for the second example, the, um, the you know, what's working, what's not working, I did that in English. Um, students can certainly write those in French if they want to, but, um, but I did that one in English. Um, for the first activity where we talk about creating like a classroom community, that um, we did in French. And the third example with the Think Pair Share, of course, we did in French as well. Um, but I think all of these could be adapted um, to meet different levels. And, um, you know, I certainly don't think that doing things in the target language should be a hindrance if you have lower level students, for instance. Okay, so let's look at some of the ideas. Oh, the trading cards. If that's a little bit like Flipgrid, right? Um, I've done something similar on Flipgrid where students will record something and then they have to respond to one other student, something like that. That's a great idea. Um, I've also seen people do those getting to know exercises where you, um, you bring in a picture of yourself and you create a name tag. And on your name tag, you put like one piece of information and maybe a hashtag that you would use to refer to yourself to part of your identity as a way to kind of um, tap into students' social media obsession, that kind of thing. Um, what is five finger feedback? I don't know who wrote that, but if the person who did, if you're willing to speak up, I'd be curious to know what that is. Feel free to unmute. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the link, Kelsey, to the trading cards. I do, so I do feedback sometimes like this, like easy, medium, hard, or yes, maybe no, like that kind of thing. But I've never heard of the five favorite, five finger feedback. Um, yeah, looking at the syllabus. So doing that syllabus, I do that syllabus quiz now. Um, collaborative commenting on the syllabus is also a really interesting idea. Oh, I like the favorite word of the language. Can the person who wrote that kind of elaborate a little bit? on how that works? Yes, I tell them my favorite word uh, in Spanish is the longest one. And students don't usually know that. Uh, so they get um, to think about the word that they like in Spanish the most. Okay, yeah, and that's... that's really interesting because then I hear all kinds of answers, sometimes not very appropriate, but they are children. So um, we laugh a little bit and then uh, we do a Kagan structure that is rally robin. Uh, so I make students go to different parts of the classroom and then they just go to a classmate and then they say the word and listen to the word and then they go to the next person and everybody listens to everyone. And then we talk about it. Nice, thanks Monica. It's nice to see you. Um... Uh, I like to, like, you could follow up and say, well, why is it your favorite word? And you could talk about whether you think it sounds nice or you like the spelling or something like that. Um, it reminds me, your example reminds me of the podcast that they do at Cornell University that Angelica Kramer um, leads. And they always ask the people who are interviewed what their favorite word is. Um, kind of like the Bernard Pivot um, um, and the, what's his name? The guy who used to do the... Um, inside the actor studio um, interviews. Um, yeah, so lots of really great ideas here. Um, yeah, I'm curious about the collaborative commenting on the syllabus. Do you ever change your syllabus based upon the students' comments? Whoever wrote that, if you wanna. Yeah, Phil speaking, hi. Yeah, hi, hi Phil. Um, so I'm an instructional designer, so 
uh, one of the instructors that I've worked with will talk about it and like explain their reasoning, but another one that I've worked with does in fact change their, their syllabus based on it. And they will then intentionally, um, from one of my own courses, um, the instructor explicitly left the uh, percentage weighting blank. And then when people inevitably commented on that, we got to decide as a class what it meant to what, what parts of the course were worth the most, right? So like there was a final, but it ended up only being like 5%, whereas our journal entries weekly were much more important to us collectively. And so we had that discussion around like how, the, how we wanted to be assessed in the course. Awesome, I love that. That's that must have been really like, empowering. It's super empowering, actually, yeah. yeah. And yeah. everyone gets to talk about it. Um, yeah. The other instructor used it mostly as like points of explanation. So like, here's where this comes from. Here's why I did I do it this way. Thanks for asking the question. If you want to talk to me more, like they're always open to it. But generally, they, they change less. Wow, that's amazing. I love that example. Yeah. Um, there's another one that just got put up on here about discussing your own language learning journey. And I feel like that's such a beautiful way to connect with your students. Um, I don't know if they always take it to heart. I mean, I've said multiple times that, um, you know, I make mistakes all the time when I'm speaking French and, um, you know, I've been speaking French for 30 some years, um, actually more than that, but uh, 40 some years, but anyway, um, but they still seem so nervous, you know, um, and, uh, I, but I do, I, I do love sharing that, you know, and kind of talking to them a little bit about it so that they can feel connected to you as an individual. Um, I, I know I have a colleague who teaches in the classroom right next door to mine. And every day when I walk by his classroom, he has a different picture of his cat up on his slide deck. Um, I think, oh, that's just so nice. It's such a, I mean, it, it shows a, an obsession with a cat, but still it like is a nice way to connect with your students and personalize your classroom. Um, okay, so we're coming up on the end. Oh, um, we're coming up on the end of the time. Uh, I'm just checking the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, but I don't know, um, Yana and Adolfo and Caitlin, do you want to just open up the floor to questions? Um, I don't know how we're going to run things now. I know sometimes you go over 15 minutes. I think I think what we can do is since it's coming up to the top of the hour, um, I, I just would like to let you know what it did. We will turn off the recording at four, um, but we will continue our conversation. So we can continue this for a few minutes uh, for those people who have questions or comments. Those of you who joined us and need to run somewhere else, we really appreciate your time um, and your you know, sharing sharing what you shared with us. Uh, it has been quite an engaging session. Um, so before we continue, uh, but I would like to remind you that our last session of the spring series will be on Monday, April 25th. Uh, so please consider joining us at that time and on that day.